like a cat. I leave the door blank that sweeps like a I must say that you are our uh, very special guest tonight on World Exposure with Cher Dial, and it's actually an honor for me, and I feel as though you are a living legend in not only the music, but songwriting, and so much more, and you just released uh, recently a book, Psychedelic Bubblegum, and so we have a lot to talk about, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. That's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for the kind words. Oh, true. What What does it mean to you when I'm sure you get people say you're a living legend? Is that how does that affect you? Do you see yourself well, I, as that? I, I've heard uh, I've heard the term uh, legend in your own mind. <laughs> oh no 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 no. <laughs> uh, I don't think of myself that way. Of course, I just think of myself as somebody. Uh, who was very blessed in his life to have a lot of success uh, in the music business and against uh, un unbelievable odds. So the odds were so great that if I had known when I started out, I probably would not have started out. It's just uh, a, a blessing to me in my life that uh, things fell together the way they did and all the people in my life that, that helped contribute to that. Yes. Yeah, that you know, that's a, I think those are the unsung heroes, really, of uh, you know anybody getting to where they are, and sometimes you just don't realize it's not just you, but it is a group of people. Oh. And um, now, when you were uh, a child, you actually wanted to grow up to be a DJ. Well, I knew I loved music, and mm -hmm. I, I was I was pretty shy as a child, and so. Uh, my solution in my mind to, you know, to to make that uh, transition between making a living in the music business and still being shy was that I could be a disc jockey and nobody would ever see me. I'd be in a room somewhere. Uh -huh. I could still be bigger than life like the disc jockeys that I heard on my local station in Phoenix, Arizona and have a great time and be in the music business. Uh, but that didn't last very long. It was my whole childhood, is the, the dream. Mm -hmm. The moment I started to make it a reality by coming, moving to Los Angeles in 1958 to go to disc jockey school, it was only a matter of uh, weeks because I got a job printing record labels uh, to, to make ends meet while I went to school. And I would pass a little recording studio on the way to work every morning and go by it every night. And it, uh, it had a big sign that on the top that said, come in and see what your voice sounds like, $10. Oh, my gosh. It, rock and roll, you know, it was new. In mm -hmm. 50, uh, Elvis had started a whole new genre, genre, maybe in 55 or so. And so the years up until that, you had to have a pretty trained voice to be a pop star. And uh, I didn't see myself that way at all. But when rock and roll came in and the rockabilly guys came in, I started to see a little bit maybe... You know, that could be me, and so. So you actually saw yourself as then instead of a disc jockey, a singer. I, I said maybe I can do this. Wow, so went, that's that's I encouraging. I, I, for ten dollars, I, I made a little demo, and it sounded great to me. The way the engineering made it sound good, and I was hooked. I dropped out of disc jockey school, and um, I started making demos there at the little studio, spending more money than I should have, and. Uh, and I had a record deal with a with a known record producer within four months. Oh my goodness! Can you imagine? What was <laughs> what was one of the first songs you wrote? Do you remember? Well, the first song I made that day was "You Are My Sunshine," which of course I didn't write. Uh huh. Uh, but that got the uh, attention of the producer that I went to see, and he said, uh, "You sound pretty good, uh, kid, but." I'm looking for people who have their own material, go home and write some songs. And so just because he said to do it, I'd never written a song, but I went home and, and started writing, and I went back to him with four songs. And I don't remember the names of all of them, but I, I know one of them was called Becky Baby because that was my girlfriend, my high school sweetheart, who I eventually married. Uh. That's it. And, uh, and he signed me on the spot when he heard those new songs. Isn't that something yeah. back then, how that could happen, and it was just so simple? Yeah, and it was it was a new time, you know. I say in the book that that uh, all these little independent labels sprung up like ghost towns, uh, or, or mining towns in the gold rush, 
because rock and roll changed everything. All these little, uh, re- all these little record companies started and knowing that all they had to do was find one, one guy, one young kid that could uh, come up with a hit for them, and they'd they'd be on the on the map as a record company. Uh huh. Yeah, you think about some of these guys, like I don't know if it was Frankie Valley or uh, any of those guys back then. People would literally see them outside singing on the street and and sign them. That's right. You know, That's those right. were the days. Those were the days before rock and roll. It was maybe three or four companies, like again it is now. But in those days, with three or four big major labels, it was really hard to get a record deal if you weren't Frank Sinatra or one of those hot, you know, acts. Uh-huh. Rock and roll came in. That changed everything. Yeah, I bet. I bet with Bobby Hart. And we are having a great conversation about his life and his new book, Psychedelic Bubblegum. And it goes also, it's about the monkeys, Boys and Hart, and from uh, Mayhem to Miracles. That's what we called it because, because of what I was talking about a few minutes ago. There, there were so many times in my life where circumstances could have gone one way, but they went the right way. And, uh, and so uh, there was mayhem. There was a lot of, mm-hmm. uh, there were a lot of uh, situations that had to be dealt with. But uh, fortunately, we made the right decisions more times than the wrong ones. And we had, had success. I met Tommy Boyce who became my main writing partner in the 60s. Uh, the same year I came, he was the same, doing the same thing, living at home in a suburb of Los Angeles, uh, putting out record singles, not having success, just like me. And we became friends and, uh, and, and te- teamed up and, uh, and, uh, and began having success uh, in, in New York. They put more to come. World Exposure with Sheer Dial will be right back. Hi, I'm John Maravillas, and if you're looking to get fit and improve your health, it's as easy as three simple steps. 60% nutrition, 40% working out, and 100% commitment. That's Fit for Life. What makes Fit for Life different? We specialize in getting your metabolism higher, even when you're not working out. Through our scientific and time-tested techniques, we've integrated a 30-minute workout that gives you the benefit of multiple hour sessions. Unlike other fitness studios, we combine strength training to tone, cardio to burn off fat from your stomach and hips, and nutrition planning and consulting to accelerate your results and make them permanent. Hi, I'm Allison. I searched the Fit for Life Challenge and lost 65 pounds. And I'm Christy. I did too, and I lost 100 pounds. I back my promise of unparalleled fitness with an unconditional 90-day money-back guarantee. If you're not completely satisfied with your results, you don't pay a dime. Call me today and And get fit for for life. We're back. And now more world exposure with Cher Dial. Excuse me, are you Mr. Phil Spector? Look, it's been a real bad day. Would you come back in April? (laughs) What is this, a convention? (laughs) Where's Bill? I don't know. Helen, will you please get oh, people out of my well, office? Uh, now. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you've shared the stage with Zsa Zsa Gabor, yes? That was later, later on when we became artists on our own, this was after the Monkees. When we got to Los Angeles, we, we got a lot of opportunities because our, pub, our music publisher was owned by Columbia Pictures and Screen Gems Television. Mm. So that movie that you just mentioned, Where Angels Go, was one of the first projects that we got sent out on and, uh, and wrote the theme song for. And we got to go to Houston, Texas, and, uh, and to, for the premiere, and uh, sit at the table next to Rosalind Russell and, and uh, cool? Susan St. James. And yeah, it was very cool. But so right after that, we, we got uh, the opportunity to, to go to another audition where we uh, convinced them we were the right guys, and, the, and we wrote the theme song to the daytime soap opera, Days mm. of Our and then uh, a, a lot of movie and TV uh, opportunities came our way that, that way. But then we got the big one, which was 
we got the interview to uh, with Bert Schneider, who was uh, one of the two people who was getting ready to do a pilot show for a television show about four singers called The Monkees. Mm. And they signed us to be the guys to produce the records and to produce the songs for their for their show. So they could lip sync to them. They could lip sync, but uh, later on, of course, they went out and became, they were for, hired as four actors, but then they became actual uh, group and went yeah. out and played their own instruments, sang their own songs, and yeah. And you always stayed friends with them, though. We did, and uh, in fact, I just talked to Mickey Dolan's a half hour ago. Uh, he's b very kindly uh, going to come in and record uh, the, the forward that he wrote for my book, Psychedelic Bubblegum. He did oh. the forward. Yeah, because you're audioing it. We're doing the audio version. Yeah. So he his, his forward for me uh, Thursday. And uh, and Peter Tork and I are going to be performing together in uh, in Boston in, uh, in three or four weeks at the... Uh, at the uh, Super Mega Fest back there on the 21st and 22nd, I believe. Yeah, I think a Comic Con. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's part of it. And uh, but they'll have a, a concert that night with uh, with some of the older acts, and we'll be signing books and autographs and so on those two days. Oh, that's got to be so exciting for you, though, to be able to you know just know the recognition you still have today. I mean, you know, in this all crazy mixed up world. And then, you know, it's someone like you comes around and is talking to people and open. And what a good feeling, you know. Anything in life that you regret not doing? Not really. Uh, sometimes I have for a while, for a, for, for a span. I talk about in the book being asked to join the Mad Dogs and Englishman tour, the Joe Cocker tour that was the musical event of 1980, 1990, wait, 1971 maybe it was. 1970s, yeah, yeah. and I was asked to go on the road and play, uh, you know, Hammond B3 and sing a couple songs. And I just, I had just gotten uh, over uh, five years of hectic time with Tommy doing that. And uh, <laughs> so I say in the book that I think, well, maybe I should have just checked my ego at the door and done it. But in retrospect, I think there's a reason I didn't do it. And uh, I always felt like God was looking out for me, and even the even the mistakes I made. Uh, turned into be, uh, you know, he makes them right if your if your heart's in the right place. Your your music and your song and you and um, you know, Mister uh, Voice, uh, you know, you have a place in American music history. I mean, do you ever think about it like that? Because you really do. Well, thank you. I I suppose that's true. But thank and... you so much for joining us tonight. My pleasure, as I said. Thank you so much, Sheriff. Yeah. This is Bobby Hart. I'm calling from Los Angeles, California, and you're watching World Exposure with Sheriff Dial. Now it's time to rock the world with L.A. Nick. L.A. Nick here. Today we're, uh, gotta start over, I can't stay today. I don't wanna stand in these weeds, man. I mean, stop fucking sitting in the weeds, Nick. Fucking move over. There could be bugs in here. I asked you three times, is my mic on? Test it. Hello, anybody there? L.A. Nick here, continuing our tour of state parks in Minnesota. Today we're at Fort Snowing State Park in the heart of the Twin Cities. Let's go check out the fort. Take the bike out and push it back. Spider! Spider! I want to join out with those guys. Don't do it. Come back! We're going to go inside now and check out the park. Okay, quickly. What is this building behind me? A fort snelling insane sign. I think it is. Nick, it's not, it's not going to do it that. You want to read a little bit from that sign? Yeah, big problem is I didn't take my heartburn pill this morning. You got heartburn. Okay, so we're uh, actually here at Fort Snelling, in Snelling Park. Um, you know, this fort was built for the U.S. Dakota War of 1862. 
it was a, it was a, they called it an internment camp. So people were forced marched here from all over. From imagine being forced marched even from the Minnesota Dakota border to this site. It'd be, I can't barely drive it in a car. Imagine marching it. Uh, it'd be pretty tough. Let's go. You know, I thought I smelled cat pee, but I think it's me. I'm thirsty. My leg hurts. I'm tired. I, I don't know. I told you to put the car here. Man, I'm hot, man. See that sign right there? No. I didn't see it. it. had a lot of dirt on it when I came through. Hey, you know, one thing I, I, I do like Fort Snelling a lot, and once you get in the park, is there's unlimited trails and there's rivers and there's, it's really cool. The biggest problem with Fort Snelling Park coming in from this entrance, which is the fork entrance, is this hill. And this hill is a very steep hill. Yeah, it's no problem going down, but wait till we're done and have to come back up. It sucks. Oh, what happened? I hurt myself. Don't have any brakes. It does, Nick. Well, they didn't work. I told you not to go so fast. I think I'll be able to push that bike back up the hill at all. Oh, bullshit, Nick. I don't. I'm not pushing it. I smell toast. I don't know, I think somebody's cooking breakfast somewhere. I'm hungry. Look at me. Uh, uh. LA Nick, downtown Minneapolis at the Stone Arch Bridge. Is it Stone Arch or Arch? LA Nick here at the mighty Mississippi River in downtown Minneapolis. To my left here is the Stone Arch Bridge that James Hill built in 1883. You obviously have, haven't done your homework. No, I, don't, I can't even see it. I can't even see it. I don't have my glasses. I can't see any of it. it it's just blurred on paper me, so it's useless. This is what I know about this place in James Hill. He built, he was a big railroad guy. He brought the railroad across the country, on the western part of the country, I think, and up to Canada. Canada wouldn't let him go on their land. So he had a skirt in the top part of the United States and he went all the way to the West Coast. Anyway, that's irrelevant to where what we're at now. This St. Anthony Mains Fall with this waterfall here from the City River, it's the only place there is one. It, you, they used all the power of that to turn to, to grind up grain. And that's what started the grain business in Minneapolis. That's why you have Gold Medal Flour, Pillsbury General Mills, they're all based in Minneapolis because of this spot. Gold Medal Flour started the, the sales decline in, in, in the 60s and 70s. So they had a switch product. So they started making gold bond foot powder. It's the same no, company. It is too. No, I never have to. Be me. Do me a favor and step forward another two feet. Don't walk like that, Nick. Come a little closer, please. Well, you always say in millimeters, so I'm walking in millimeters. I'm walking in millimeters and I'm cold. Yeah, I gotta be me. Now can we get some lunch? Cause I'm hungry. We're back, and now more world exposure with Share Dial. <laughs> Showtime. <laughs> it's funny, we yell showtime and the dogs jump up on the couch. They All actually right. go into position. <laughs> showtime. Oh, wait, the dial pads on your head. Let me move it really quick. All right. How are you doing, Cher? Oh, you know what? I am doing great. And I am so happy to finally meet you guys. Yeah. I have heard so many, exactly, <laughs> <laughs> so many good things about you. Not only about just, uh, you know, all of you as uh people being so nice to everybody but also your shows your music and i just really thank you for taking the time today thank and you. of, of course our next guest is a band based out of minneapolis and you perform soul jazz funk 
reggae and bluegrass and what don't you perform <laughs> um heavy metal uh, <laughs> that is great i know uh you guys are playing a lot around town and i just wanted to welcome uh frog leg to world exposure with share dial okay. <laughs> and maybe you could introduce yourselves um and also the other band members and what instruments they play because you got a lot of diversity in your band and i would love to know more about them also it's a big group um, my name's joe dunn um, i'm a guitar player and singer and i'm a guitar player and singer as well and uh we got what's sam you, what's your name man <laughs> dimitri yeah and uh then we got uh sam haltman on the keyboards uh, Gus Watcott on the bass, Rio Kellerman on the drums, Doug Christensen on percussion, and Elliot Walks on saxophone. So we got a seven-piece band. Yeah, that's what I say. It is huge. And, um, of course, every night, every Thursday night, you play at Bunkers. How long have you been doing that? A little over three years. We started three in years. August, August of 2012 was our first time, uh, on the bunker stage. We've been loving it ever since. Well, that's a really good gig, huh? And you get to play with other musicians too that come in, I'm sure. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. We've had we've had some special guests. We've had Jelly Bean Johnson from the time sit in with us and a cavalcade of all kinds of different friends that we've uh, met over the last couple of years. Sure. Yeah. sure. And uh, how did you actually get the name Frog Leg? <laughs> well, it actually came from having the bunkers gig. Mm. It, we uh, we were really on crunch time, and we were just trying to just come up with name after name after name, and we came down to like two or three, and I don't remember what the other two were. Yeah, but one of them was frog leg, and we just decided to roll with it. I don't know. There's, a, there's like a frog leg. <laughs> Like just random, you know. <laughs> it ended up it, like I didn't like it. I remember I didn't like it at first, but it slowly grew on me, and now, yeah. it's, now it's become a, a tangible thing. Yeah, yeah, I like I like it. Maybe we should have prepared a cooler story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's kind of well, cool. I mean, it, yeah. Yeah. so we picked one. Yeah. yeah. Oh gosh, that's crazy. Now, has this original band all been together, or have you had uh, changes within? You maybe you could give us a little background on how you got together. Um. Yeah, we we've had many uh, incarnations, I guess, so to speak, of the, the band. Uh, we first started out as a five piece, and it was uh, me, Dimitri, and then our friend uh, Will Efforts, who's no longer in the band. And then Gus Whatcut has been there. He's the bass player. He's been there through the whole picture. And then uh, we originally had a guy named Connor McRae Hammergren on drums, and he's now playing with uh, Davina and the Vagabonds. Oh yes. And they're they're doing great. They're tou touring the world, and it's good to see it's good to see him kicking butt up there. Yeah. <laughs> right. I know. I've seen him perform. It's pretty cool. Oh yeah, they're a great band. You know, I've said this before, but it's really true. It seems like Minneapolis for uh, groups, you know, everybody tries to help out each other. You know, yeah. like, hey, I, you know, my bass player is sick tonight. Can you fill in? And then all of a sudden, you know, you got a mix of guys from like three different bands filling in for a band. And I think that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a great, Absolutely. great, helpful conglomerate here in the Twin Cities of great musicians who are all who've all got each other's back, it's great, it's great. Have you always been musicians, or is that something that kind of came later on in your life? Um, for me, I've always been super, super into music. When I, you know, when, my, when I was little, my parents gave me little toy guitars with the buttons on uh -huh. it. I was always nagging my parents to get me a guitar. And finally, they got me one, I think, when I was like nine or ten. And, you know, and yeah, pretty, pretty similar for me, too. <laughs> I was singing in the shower as a kid all the time. Uh, <laughs> and you're Demetri, are you from here, Minneapolis? Uh, we're both uh, from Minnetonka, where we are right now. Yeah. And uh, we, we uh, when I got offered the Bunkers gig, uh, it was offered to me through a family friend, and I was like, I went to high school with Joe here, and I was like, and I, I never really played with him. I played with him a little bit here and there, but. Uh, he had already uh, written a bunch of songs and released two CDs in high school, and I was like, "Hey, you can! I got this opportunity to throw together a band." And I'm like, 
I wanted to uh, <laughs> get bailed to Joe Duff. Hey. And, so, and especially the name was very attracting too, I'm sure. Joe Duff. Frog Joe leg. Oh, oh yeah. Frog. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, um, we are going to take a quick break here to hear from our sponsors. And once again, we will be back on World Exposure with Share Dial after we hear these messages. Stay put, more to come. World Exposure with Share Dial will be right back. Hair trends, hair transformation, and hair tranquility begin at Hair Trinity. Hair Trinity Salon, located in New Brighton, offers you elegant, sophisticated, and business stylings to crazy, sexy, cool. Provided by certified stylists that help you create your own style in your image because one style doesn't fit all. Affordably priced for all hair and types. Hair Trinity Salon, located at 1437 Silver Lake Road in New Brighton. We're back. And now more world exposure with Cher Dial. We're back from this commercial break. How was that, guys? You needed a break, didn't you? I could tell. Little break, little break, you know. <laughs> right, and, uh, we are back on World Exposure with Cher Dial with Frogleg from Minneapolis. And like I have said before, I heard so many good things about you, and you put on an amazing live show. What goes into the production of a show of yours? Mainly the set list writing is the, one of the biggest parts. We like to... We like to kind of blend songs together and kind of do, you know, a nonstop, you know, five song chunk. And each night we try to make it different um, as far as which songs are in the set list and then just how we approach the music. There's a lot of, we try to improvise a lot in the amount of session. Yeah, uh, yeah, Bunker, having a weekly gig has been super helpful for that and uh, mm -hmm. forcing us to you know, get a lot of songs to make it as different as possible, uh, week to week. And, and yeah, the, and all my favorite, uh, bands and, uh, musicians tend to do a similar kind of format. Yeah, and, and Joe, do you ever, uh, get nervous going up in front of all the people? Because I'm sure they interact with you a lot. They, you know, they... Honestly, I I don't get too nervous. It's after after doing it every week for three years. I mean, in the beginning, of course, there was a little bit of you know, uh -huh. and especially being that we were you know we had so little time to throw this all together, it was a little bit nerve wracking. But being in the flow of things now, it's just kind of natural. Different. Yeah, it feels it feels good. I, I get excited every time. It's it's always just something that I look forward to. Yeah. Yeah. And I know your steam is really building up with your fans. What is your secret to, you know, keeping them active in, in everything you're doing? Because it's like your fans are growing and growing by the week. Uh, I think it goes back to that uh, mixing up uh, our shows week to week as much as possible. And uh, on our Facebook page, we, we post every set list that we do. And I think people, oh, people okay. like that. And uh, cool. it's, it's definitely not a format that we invented this uh changing our shows every time we play but uh it's a it's a format that i think people really enjoy and uh, it keeps them coming back that's true the, the different every time yeah yeah different every time How hard is it for you to transition into like uh you know cutting a song and being just at a certain time in a certain way and not improvising is that like really hard for you it was it was interesting because we we recorded our first album in uh, we recorded it in 2013 um, over at the Brew House Studio in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. It was really cool the way they did it because uh, they were they were friends of ours and fans of the band, and so they wanted to they 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 helped us capture that. And what we did is we were we played all the songs live in the studio, full band. Everybody was in there. Some of us were isolated in different rooms and stuff but uh um there were there were most of the songs were pretty cut where we knew exactly how long things were supposed to be but okay. then there, there was a couple on there where you know it's a little it's a little more open and what we did is we uh just played through it a couple times and then once we found one that we kind of liked we'd literally sit there and count how many measures of stuff it was <laughs> so you won't go over yeah, so that we wouldn't go over and screw it up or anything, and uh, yeah, it was interesting, and it was nice having people like Doug, Doug and Rio, there, our uh, rhythm section, uh, 
they were they were kind of our cue men for like how long because they're oh, all, yeah because you know they, solo needs to end yeah here. they, they give, give us a look uh -huh. <laughs> but yeah it was interesting yeah I was I was because when that was one of the things that I was a little bit worried about going into the studio was the improvisational aspect of it but it worked out pretty well so every song like just ends abruptly <laughs> wouldn't that be funny. <laughs> it just yeah. ends every song, you know. They go, <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Well, I wanted to talk about um, the song "Through Your Eyes." Now that's a great song, and it's. I assume it's about looking at things through your eyes at other people, and it's a really beautiful song. Yeah, that's actually one of the ones that I wrote back in high school. It was on one of those original uh, solo albums that I did, and. Uh, yeah, it was just one of those tunes. I had a few friends that were going through some tough stuff, some uh, just um, self-conscious, you know, dilemmas. And uh, I just wrote a song about, it's not about women, and it's not about men, it's about everybody just reminding everybody that they're beautiful, you know? Oh, it's, yeah. It's just, a, you know, it's one of those songs that I just wrote for everyone. No, I was going to say, like, everybody can relate to it. As soon as I start listening to it, I'm thinking, wow, that's relatable. And I love that when you can, as a writer, write a song and people can relate in so many ways. I think that's got to be so fulfilling. It is. It's, that's why I do it. Yeah. And what about the song now, Skyline Blues? That's like a total bluegrass yep. type song. So <laughs> I, I love that aspect of it too. It's just like you have something, like you say, for everybody. And yeah. what, what about that song, Skyline um, Blues? That song I wrote while I was living in St. Paul, and it was the dead of winter. And, uh, you know, it was snowing all the time, really dark and dreary outside. And it was just about living in the city and kind of being bored and also being a little bit, you know, thrown by the, how fast life's moving and all the stuff the city life throws at you. That's just the skyline. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> You're very right on top of everything with uh, society today, hey. that's for sure. <laughs> you guys, what are your hopes and your dreams for the future, say, like five years from now? Um, for the band, I'd love to be, you know, touring nationally and playing big venues and uh, yeah. have, have, have a lot more music under our belt, get a couple more albums out. And, oh, yeah. Uh, are you working on any projects now? Um, not yet, but we're hoping. We've been we've been talking about it, and we're hoping sometime at the beginning of 2016 to get back into the studio and uh, yeah, we start cranking out CD number two. Thank you once again, Joe and Dimitri from Frog sure. Leg, for uh, joining us today on World Exposure with Shared Dial. Thank you, Cher. It was a blast. Thank you. Yeah, it was fun. I'm Dimitri Rollis. And I'm Joe Dunn. We're from Frog Leg, and you're watching World Exposure with Shared Dial. <laughs> <laughs>